Welcome back. You're listening to Stribblings, New York. I'm your host, Rob Taub, on WOR AM Radio 710 on your digital dial. I know that most, if not all, of our listeners, or as all, if not most of our listeners, have heard of the author Lee Child. And Lee is not going to be on the show today, but have somebody even better. Andy Martin is a professor of French, or a lecturer in French, according to, to him and not Lee. Lee calls him professor. At Cambridge, welcome, Andy. Is, is, how do we, is Cambridge like a lot of schools like Oxford? Hey, Rob. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I love that line, better than Lee Child. I'm going to quote that to Lee the next time I bump into him. I think it's his nightmare, actually, that uh, he's, you know, it lies awake at, at night, I think, actually, worrying about me getting bigger sales than him. But well, Andy and I met, met over Twitter, uh, which is great, because so many of the guests that have ended up on this show and so many authors uh, I've connected with that way. And you've written a book called Reacher Said Nothing. Lee Child says a lot. Uh, the Lee Child and the Making of Make Me, which I reviewed for the Huffington Post and uh, I think was a fabulous book and one of of Lee's best and a really unique departure for him. What 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 can you tell us about the book? Oh, make make me right. Uh, <clears throat> well, and about you, your book too. Okay. More than uh, okay. Well, I better not. All right. Well, I'm going to give away the ending. The last word is needle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you want to know what that needle is doing there, you're going to have to read the rest of the book, uh, and it is rather fascinating. Um, yeah, it is uh, one of his great books. I mean, I, I love all the Reacher stuff. Let, I should just make clear, actually, that I, I although I'm a kind of fan of Lee Charles, when I wrote my book, Reacher Said Nothing, uh, which is one of his you know classic recurrent lines, um, I tried to be like the guy in the white coat. I was trying to be detached. I was trying to sort of you know observe in a quasi-scientific way precisely what he was getting up to because... I was not there just because it was fun hanging out with Lee. Well, let me set the stage for us, too, to interrupt you for a second. What's really unique about this book, and I made a note here that says George Plimpton. So George Plimpton was an American writer, although he had kind of a fake English accent. I was always trying to figure that out. (laughs) I was working at the Paris Review. It was was like a boarding school accent. And (laughs) he always insinuated himself into one sport or another. He boxed with Archie Moore. He played quarterback for the Detroit Lions. And what you did was kind of be... A far more intellectual George Plimpton, you contacted Lee Child, which is really a, a great thing to do and a ballsy thing, and said, can I watch you write? Which I can imagine this pitch to your publisher. Watch him write. It's like I, I think you mentioned in the book watching Paint Dry. And amazingly, I don't know who's braver, Lee said yes, and you've written this amazing, compelling, unique book. Rob, I really appreciate the, those comments. But yeah, it was crazy. I, I mean, now look back on it. I think of it as pretty weird, but hopefully it turned out wonderful. But yes, the most amazing thing is that, apart from me suggesting the idea in the first place, Lee's saying yes, and it's got a kind of novelistic quality about it, because I just dreamed up this idea on the spur of the moment in the middle of August, and I sent an email to, to Lee, and it just so happened that he was starting, as he starts every year, a new book on September the 1st. So he shot an email back to me saying, well, all right, if you're serious about this, you better get on over here. I'm um, starting on Monday. <laughs> So I thought, well, that's like fate knocking at the door. I mean, you know, because it was purely hypothetical. I thought, oh, maybe, nah, that'll never work out. And then he says, okay. So I thought, well, I better do it. And uh, neither of us really had any idea how it was going to work out. Because I want to be clear, although, yeah, you're right, I'm an academic, I teach at Cambridge, but I never had to sort of write up a proposal about this. I never sought funding. I didn't seek approval from anyone. It was a spur of the moment just wing it kind of an idea. And uh, that was what appealed, I think, to Lee, because that is the way he works. Well, it's what's rare for me is you're not a typical academic, as most of them have disdain for the Lee Childs of the world and thriller writers, as I found, because I used to review two thrillers a week when I wrote for People magazine. And uh, academics, well, first of all, People Magazine, it was, you know, they, they wouldn't blow their nose with that, and they just, you know, <laughs> what do you mean, a, a thriller? And we've, could have, we've had John Land on the show who can explain it takes a long time the difference between a mystery and a thriller. I just like whatever grabs me and I find compelling, and I digress a lot on this show, so I, I'm also fascinated by the fact that you're a professor of French, 
uh, and and I wondered like how, you know how do you get a doctorate in French? Do you study certain things like condescension and insouciance and shrugging and looking at people with disdain? What, is that part? today we will learn how to sneer at people? Yes, soixante neuf obviously is is right up there. But um, yeah, I mean uh, it gives you good one liners like such as hell as other people, which sort of fits into the the thriller genre quite well. But I completely understand. <clears throat> what you're saying that there's a kind of literary snobbery. Uh, can I just say on, on behalf of Cambridge that although there is an element of that, to be fair, inevitably, as there is anywhere, nevertheless, one thing perhaps you, you may not be aware of, Lee Child actually gave a talk in Cambridge last week. He was I in, saw it on Twitter. He was in conversation with me, and that was real. Uh, I was not faking it. That That actually happened. And so, you know... There has been a kind of, um, you know, a, a melting of the ice to some extent, actually. I mean, I, I can remember several years ago, just as you say, I had proposed to, to someone in the English faculty that, yeah, oh, let's bring Lee Child to Cambridge. And there was this kind of, well, old boy, I, I feel that he's not really quite our cup of tea, is he? Uh and that, that actually happened. But now, and this was not my idea that you should cut, it was the idea of some people in the English faculty. So there is this other constituency of people who see literature and culture at large as a kind of continuum and don't make these, you know, set up these silly polarities between, you know, commercial popcorn and serious literary and so on. Because let's face it, anyone who's read a Lee Child knows that he is not popcorn. He is, at some level, completely serious, although super successful. Well, you made a, a great analogy in the book. You made a couple of great comments. Uh, I hope I wrote one of them down. Uh, <laughs> Lee writes like a reader, and I love this one, writing is show business for shy people. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because he got into it, funny enough, through, through television, one has to say. By the way, one thing I discovered, Cambridge University rejected him 40 years ago, and clearly that was the making of him. Uh, he went on to study law at Sheffield University, and he hasn't paid a single parking ticket since then. Uh, but yeah, he went into TV, and then he got the sack from TV, thus becoming a writer. Uh, because, you know, it was his last option, I think. But it kind of worked out quite quite well for him. Uh, but I, I guess he, he doesn't see a massive distinction between working in television and, and writing. He, he never set out to be a writer, and okay, he tries to think like a reader. And one of his funny put-downs, he doesn't put down many writers. Okay, one or two, and there's at least one I can think of. He wants to have, you know, kind of a duel with one of these days. But his, his sort of generic put-down of a certain writerly mentality is, hey, Ma, look, I'm writing, you know, and he tries not to do that. So he's like the opposite of that. And it's a style that, okay, here I'm doing my academic thing. It's, it's, it's a style that Roland Barthes, the great French critic, described as the degree zero. And he was applying that to uh, Albert Camus, in fact. But I kind of apply that to Lee. And I think Lee is even, you know, sub-zero, very minimalist, very economical in style. And I think it's partly that that appealed to me. Well, you called him compact. Yeah. And I have interviewed Lee a few times. And I gathered, kind of having read his work, he doesn't do a lot of research. But he has a fantastic memory. And he has a real affection. I think he's probably knows more, has seen more, certainly writes about it more, the, the Midwest and just the heartland of America than, than I have. Uh, I've never been to Nebraska or Kansas. I've flown over them. I looked out the window of the plane a few times, uh, interrupting my naps. But he has a real sense of these places or a real affection for them. And that's another thing that makes him unique. But you mentioned, I love this analogy because... I talk so much about books and authors with people, and then they'll say, well, who's your absolute favorite author? And I'll say, who's your favorite actor? You, know, you, you could like, I like Jeff Bridges. I like Don Cheadle. They're never going to play the same part, probably. Uh, I, I liked Marlon Brando, but I also liked Rod Steiger, and they were both in the back of the cab on Waterfront. And writers are like that as well. You, and you, you mentioned method writing, that Lee is not a method writer. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's like the opposite of a method writer. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, he, he wants to find his methodology in one word, clueless. Uh, you know, I feel that can't be quite right because it's sort of, he's done a few now. So every now and then I, 
you know, in my kind of pushy way, try, try to describe what his method is. And I mean, I could sort of summarize it for you now, but that the, there's kind of, yeah, there's two, because I've often said to him, hey, you, you know what, could we get a computer to write your next novel? And he kind of half goes along with that. And the reason for that is there are only two rules in a Reacher book. Thus, you could call it a kind of binary logic, in fact. One rule is Jack Reacher better darn well pop up at some stage. Otherwise, those readers are going to be really let down and disappoint, and there will be a riot in the street. Where is Reacher? Okay, the second rule is Reacher had better have a, an antagonist to, to fight against. So you've got this basic, you've got a protagonist, Reacher, antagonist, could be whoever. Uh, and the interesting thing is that, okay, summarizing, what do those two words have in common? The word Aegon. So it's at, from the Greek, you know, meaning struggle or arena. So, so each of those novels sets out an arena in which forces are in play. And the, then you have, you have the novel. But I'll just add one thing to that. There's, when Lee says, oh, this is why a computer couldn't write it, there's a kind of madness. Look at the second sentence of Make Me. Okay, you've got a big body being moved, buried. And then the second sentence, which computer would write, come on, Big Blue, have a shot at this. Uh, it was like trying to haul a, a mattress, a king-size mattress, off a waterbed, uh, which is weird. And the second <laughs> sentence of a thriller, it impresses me that he would get a waterbed in there. Well, what does he have the same method for every book because he doesn't, if he doesn't do any research, does he really just sit down and just start writing? Well, you're absolutely right. Very he, Dickensian. He, yeah, yeah. He, 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 well, he has this rather English phrase about, which I don't think you've got over here, but it always makes me laugh about research because often readers will say, hey, come on, have you done the research? And he will, he will yawn. And then it will come out this phrase, I can't be asked to do any research, but <laughs> he, um, he does read so much. He reads something like 300 books a year, which is incredible. And he has this amazingly Velcro mind. So he will go around quoting lines from Shakespeare and whatnot. So at some level, all of it feeds in there. But OK, here's a, here's a very simple thing. He is very open. And OK, there's a slightly mystic thing to this, which I want to mention. But here, here's a very simple thing of the way he operates. And, you know, writers out there who want to, you know, cut yourselves off in a log cabin, don't do it. Because here's how he works. So one day we're sitting there and, you know, the maid is bumping around in the room next door, you know, doing what housekeepers do. And so I notice, because I'm looking over his shoulder at the time, in the next line, we've got the word bucket. Okay, use it in a weird way, but bucket gets in there. And okay, then immediately afterwards, there's a massive load of noise next door, the construction work. In the next line, we have nail. So he, he is completely open. Those, those things which you might consider, oh my God, it's a distraction. I've got to you know, put the earphones on or cut myself off. No, he lets it all kind of leak in secretly to seep into his own work. Uh, another question I have, is it true you mentioned how many cups of coffee and how many <laughs> cigarettes he smokes a day? I love Lee's New Year's resolution, don't quit smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> he has so many bad habits. I mean, the whole book could be dedicated to that, you know, lost, lost count. But yeah, he normally kind of restrains himself and keeps it down to about 20 cups of coffee a day, I think, actually. But he has been known to go over 30, which is insane. By the way, I, I have pointed out to him occasionally, I believe Balzac killed himself with too much coffee, but he doesn't care. He's got this kind of fatalistic attitude, which is kind of cool and I think stands him in good stead. But look, here's one really weird thing. And I mean, I try to be, as I said, sort of scientific. See, okay, I'm going to observe. I'm going to see. I'm going to take notes. But there are certain things that happen in the creative process which are mind-blowing. Rob, can I just mention one of yes, them? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, because look, people can sort of check this. It's in the book. Read it. I'm not giving anything away here, but there's a character in there in the home invasion scene called Lydia Lair. Good name. There is a real Lydia Lair out there. And I know this because I went to speak to her and she lives in San Antonio, Texas. She got her name in there by donating a, a healthy sum to a very good cause, heart charity, I believe, actually, not to Lee, uh, to have her name attached to a character. Brilliant. Now, listen, the only thing that Lee knew about her was two things, Lydia and Lair. That was it. When I heard about this, I wanted, I wanted to do some research. He said, no, I can't be asked. 
as he always does. You know, I'm just going to stick with that. I go to interview her. She has read the book. She comes across her own character in the book. And she goes, oh, my God. I am married in the book, Lydia Lair is, to Dr. Evan Lair. Lo and behold, and Lee, Lee had no idea about any of this, the love of her life was a guy called Evan, who died a la James Dean, age 20, in a car crash. She is, she is now 50. She has never forgotten him. She is now married to a nice guy called Jean-Pierre. However, Evan remains, and he was training to be, guess what? a doctor. Now, suddenly, in that chapter, oh my God, I'm married to Dr. Evan Lair. Lee, somehow, okay, call it coincidence, if you will, has resurrected, mysteriously, the love of her life. So Lee has some kind of karmic connection he, with he, people like He guess. does. I mean, you know, the Jung phrase for this is collective unconscious, but often he's sitting around and he says, I'm trying not to think right now. Okay, there's one scene in the book you might remember. I come across him, he's lying on the sofa, uh, with his feet up, and, you know, his eyes are closed. He's got a cigarette in one hand. <laughs> the smoke is spiraling up to the ceiling. And I'm kind of sitting there, sort of, you know, watching, as I do in my scientific way, and he says to me, I am working, you know. And in some sense he is, because he is what he calls daydreaming. Mm -hmm. And when he does that daydreaming, when in some sense he kind of switches off, you know, his rational mind, I, I sort of suspect he makes those connections with other people, without necessarily knowing it or thinking about it, but those connections, you know, are made. And this, this I think, is what perhaps, at some level, produces a best-selling writer, the okay. ability to do we that. Got, we're going to have to wrap in a moment. I, I just want to really recommend this book, Reacher Said Nothing, by Andy Martin. It's fantastic. And it's published by... Everybody's merged these days. Random House Books, Bantam Books, Penguin, Penguin Random House, LLC. <laughs> Go buy this book. And, and, and you've kind of come up with a George Plimpton, Gay Talese type of journalism that you've, you've merged. It's really excellent. And uh, I hope you're going to get another writer and, or, or somebody else and, and do the same thing. But thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rob.